Welcome back to another exploration of the Columbian Exposition or Chicago World's Fair of 1893. In this episode, we will cover imagery that is contained in Campbell's illustrated history of the world's Columbian Exposition, Volume 1. Seeing as we went through various foundational aspects of photo manipulation in the previous video, we are going to dive directly into some imagery and get through as many as possible within this book. We will not browse every image that this book has to offer, and I advise anyone interested to check out the link below and explore for yourself. So let's recall that this publication states that there are a mixture of photographs, illustrations, and engravings. So we will attempt to keep track of which images are classified as such. We begin with our first image, labeled Scene from Sylvan Walks of Jackson Park, World's Fair site. Initially, we see, or don't see, rather, any indication of what this image is. At a glance, it appears as a photograph, yet it's rough. It has a ruggedness to it that would indicate illustrative elements. The thing is with these images is not all of them have easy indications and many of my opinions are speculative. I believe some speculation is warranted when we don't have even a medium stated. There are a few strange artifacts, such as this discolored grey patch in the bottom right, right here, beside this post. The flat grey colouring of leaves, branches, and bark on this large tree central in the image. And the highlight in the center of this image seems overly bright, but maybe the sun was in that direction behind the trees. Hard to say. Anyways, let's continue on to our next image. This one is labeled as the Crystal Lake in Jackson Park, World's Fair site. In many of these images, I always find it peculiar how some of these photos appear, for a lack of a better term, staged. Very rarely are there just regular people uh, meandering about, especially at a park such as this. And maybe this was the point of the publication. It was to specifically include imagery that was tailored to this event, and they did not want public interference which I can understand to an extent. It just feels odd or even eerie with these seemingly placed individuals. But let's examine this one. So initially, no indication of a medium. Now let's look down to the bottom right of the image and immediately see how this tree here has illustrated elements the bottom half, anyways. The highlights on the right side of the tree are all illustrated or painted or brushed. And along with the ground or grass and the foliage surrounding the base of the tree, you can visibly see the brush strokes and the highlights in some cases. Now looking up slightly at this woman at the edge of the basin, we see that she has a, a highlight applied to the bottom of her dress. Now moving along to the left, the underside of the bridge seems to have a strong highlighted marking or stroke element going along the contour here. Now we move to the metal railing that has clear highlight markings, especially the planters and moving to the left as the railing goes off into the darkness, you can visibly see the illustrated highlights. One other detail I found interesting is the reflection of where the plants are. The reflection of the plant, almost in the middle of the photo, does not look like a plant. It almost looks like an obelisk, or at least an object much taller than the planter. The one on the left isn't as big and could be a perspective issue, but it is also quite tall. However, it is darker. Overall, another strange image in this book. Our next image is titled Midway Placence 
connecting Washington and Jackson Parks, part of the World's Fair site. No indication of a medium. Yet this appears to be a photograph. We do have what appears to be illustrative highlights on some of the closer trees. The first three trees on the right have strokes on the sides. Zooming in, it appears that you can even differentiate the brush strokes of the highlights, especially on the second tree here on the right branch. Now, there could be natural happenings that create an inconsistent light pattern, such as it being a tree and doing tree things, like being surrounded by other trees and creating shadows. That makes sense. However, these highlights are just too thick, and they're also on both sides of the branch. They just seem out of place. In comparison with the other trees in this frame, the lighting appears inconsistent. With images like this, it seems that if there was editing done, it was fairly benign. Simple highlights to improve the visibility of elements, enhancing contrast, simple and effective. What we are looking to accomplish is gather evidence of manipulation and inquire if the editing was purely cosmetic or had other purposes of perception, say if there was something to hide or distort the historical lines. The power and control one could claim of historical authority through visual storytelling of photos, while simultaneously having the ability to edit those photos, would seemingly be almost absolute. I'm not necessarily saying this was done here, but to not consider something of that nature feels like an oversight. Anyways, let's continue on. Here, believe it or not, we have an actual photograph. This one is labeled, and it reads, Reflection Pond, Jackson Park, World's Fair Site and you can see the indication of it being labeled a photograph here, being put on the bottom of the railing. Overall, it looks like a photograph. I don't really have much to say or report on this one in particular. However, it was the first image so far that actually indicated a medium. I felt that was important to represent. A quick side here. I would like to do a demonstration to clarify the term stroke. I understand that not everyone will be familiar with certain terminology and want to ensure that you have at least a basic understanding of what is being discussed. So when I use the term stroke, what exactly does that mean? A stroke is essentially a visible outline or border of an element, object, or path. It is a line of color that precisely follows a path and could also be viewed as a, a digital brush stroke or outline. So looking at one of our most recent examples, we have two images of the same trees that I mentioned have strokes or highlights. Next we have the same image with some rudimentary strokes applied. These are digital brush strokes, you could say, that can be applied to an image and adjusted in numerous ways. In this case, they are quite poorly done, however, this is merely to illustrate my meaning of when I say there appears to be a stroke or highlight applied. We can increase the size of the stroke or decrease the size. We can also use any color and apply it to the stroke to meet your desired outcome. The main difference being that any strokes or highlights applied during the 19th century would be done by hand. This doesn't necessarily mean that it is less impressive because the inconsistency of a tangible brush stroke could add an authenticity factor to images. It would only increase the probability of making an error. Applying too much color, 
using a thicker brush than intended, slicing too much from a particular asset or subject, etc. Our next image, again, has no medium. Looking at the left side of the image, we can see this group of three trees that have been highlighted. The same treatment has been applied to some of the trees on the right side of the image, on the other side of the road. Now further down the path, if we zoom in, it appears there is a wagon, possibly, and one of the wheels has been highlighted or has a lighter stroke on it on the right side, right here. The bridge on the right side possibly has some illustrated elements, however it is somewhat hard to discern. So moving on to our next image, we see some initial stages of development of the World's Fair. This image is titled First Earth Turned in Jackson Park on the World's Fair site. Now images such as this always perplex me in terms of an event such as the Colombian World's Fair or the Chicago World's Fair. There was vague mentions of workforces within many of the books in my collection, however I was able to dig up one number that represented a workforce at this site. This is a clipping from The Star from Reynoldsville, Pennsylvania, May 17th, 1893. During the construction period, Director General Davis has commanded more than 15,000 men at a time. So we have an indication here that there was at least 15,000 men working at any given time. There may be other documents that point to similar numerical figures, and I'm sure the total workforce would easily be in the tens of thousands. Seeing as this project was expected to be the most extravagant fair to date, a workforce of this size would seemingly be status quo. This clipping is from the Pittsburgh Dispatch, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, October 22nd, 1892. The World's Columbian Exposition is to cost three times as much as any previous exposition in the history of the world. It occupies about four times as many acres, and has about twice as much space under roof as the greatest of former expositions. No exposition of the past has ever received the support of more than one-third the nations of the world, while the Columbian Exposition has received recognition and applications for space from every civilized nation of the globe. Now, let's take a look at a few more images before going into some historical documents that discuss the initial stages of construction. Next, we have an image called Work Progression in Jackson Park on the World's Fair site. Once again, a no indication of a medium. The only really striking element that stuck out to me is the amount of people working can be counted on one hand. There may be more horses even in this image than people. Something that did look a little off is this discoloration of the water in the upper right part of the image. It almost seems to lose the texture of the water and become a flatter color. It could be nothing. I'm merely pointing out oddities and inconsistencies. This next image is labeled Dredging Out Lagoons, Jackson Park. World's Fair site. You can understand the skepticism of these types of documents as we again have no medium. This one has a few oddities, so let's get into the inspection. Initially, this is the first indication of any technology being used to help with this endeavor. And first I would like to note this blurring or foggy effect and would like those who watched the previous video to recall the initial masking demonstration. I showed a gentleman's headshot that had been masked and his clothing had a similar effect, basically smoothing out or blending any rough edges from an added element. So could that be the case here? It is certainly questionable. Next we have this odd pattern of dark strokes above the dredging crane that appears out of place. 
And looking just below that, we have this strange object hanging from the telephone pole that is this unusual triangular shape with a rounded bottom. Now, from here, if we look from that point and go directly downwards, we run into this strange line in the image. Now, I'm unsure if this is actually part of the image, but we have this indication of a white stroke or a white line at the beginning or bottom of this image. It just is a bit strange. Now, looking closely, how many people are in this image working? Can you see anyone? There are some in the depths of the photo and still find that incredibly odd that we have to strain to find people working. Now lastly, I do also question this house in the middle, behind the mounds of dirt. The closer you zoom, the more it appears the left window has a blob of color over it. Possibly an artifact, possibly an illustration, or maybe even an asset. Maybe it was there in reality. There may be more indications of editing, but we're going to move on to our next image. Now this is our last image in this volume of the initial construction phases of this event. What I would like you to consider as we scroll through these images again is what exactly these are depicting. Do we have any real landmarks or indications of where these are taken? With the foundation from our previous video, we know that assets can be removed, added in, illustrated, painted over, layered, and masked into imagery. These could be actual photographs of the initial construction, or they could literally be of something different entirely. There is historical documentation of a substantial workforce being employed, yet why are they not documented? What is the thought process here? Who approved these specific documented photos or images? And we don't know if these are photographs, I suppose. Anyways, this is expected to be the largest event in American history thus far. And this is the initial construction documentation? This is what all open avenues could afford for these photographers? How could you not take a photo of the several thousand people who are supposed to be working on this project. We don't even have a simple before and after photo of what an area looked like before and what it was turned into, of a lagoon, of a building, of a path, of anything. Now, to be fair, this is one book. And the reason I'm going in particularly hard on this specific publication is because it has chosen to talk the talk, being the most authentic and correct history furnished by officials, winning the highest and only award. Yet despite all of these accolades and high regards from officials, this publication feels lackluster almost artificial in its substance. In some cases, these images feel like a mock-up you would see at a construction site, or an airport, or a newly renovated housing unit that represent a scene of the newly constructed space. You have an image of what the space will look like, and it usually has individuals placed in for context. And taking a quick glance, it may seem realistic, however, the longer you look and the closer you look, you realize that certain aspects just don't jive. The perspective of things is not quite accurate with the people who have been placed into the image. And this is the kind of feeling I get looking through some of these documents, as if to say, this is all you could muster? This is authenticity? This is historical documentation? Let's continue on. The next point is that we must remember that this was no small task. 
Here we have another mention from the same paper as sourced earlier, The Star, May 17th, 1893. And it reads, A little over two years ago, the site of the World's Columbian Fair at Chicago was practically a marsh. Today it contains several hundred buildings, and Director General Davis estimates the wealth represented by the buildings and exhibits as something like 150 million. So let's take a look at another document discussing this topic. This section coming from a book titled History of the World's Fair, being a complete description of the world's Columbian Exposition. It reads as follows. The Jackson Park of 1891 and the Jackson Park of 1893 present a system of transformation that cannot be adequately described. Suffice it to say that the Jackson Park of 1891 was about as uninviting a strip of sand ridges and scrub oaks as fringes Lake Michigan at any point. Two years ago, this unsightly strip did not possess one redeeming feature except area and location. Today, it is not only the most beautiful and spectacular spot in the world, but it is the grandest and most gorgeous transformation seen ever presented to mankind. In January 1891, there were 556 acres of swampy, ridgy, sandy ground with here and there clumps of scrubby trees and some herbage. So once again, another section from the same book which mentions the scale of Earth moved. It reads as follows. The first shovelful of soil was removed in February 1891, and in six months 1,200,000 cubic yards of Earth had been handled, costing within $5,000 of half a million. Now, I did a quick conversion just for fun. What is stated is that 1.2 million cubic yards of earth had been handled. That is roughly 1.1 million tons or 2.3 billion pounds of dirt. These are just funny numbers to me at this point. I cannot equate that amount of earth. I have zero frame of reference. It merely sounds incredibly monumental. And this was done within months, weeks even, because the entirety of this event was completed within two and a half years. This is 1890, remember, in Chicago, with Chicago winters, no less. And in all honesty, the documentation shows absolutely nothing of the sort. They do not represent the incredible geoengineering required to lay the foundation for this event whatsoever. So looking back at this image from Campbell's Illustrated History, that was apparently privy to all information and had access to all aspects of this fair from its inception to its close. And they only managed to photograph a motley crew of construction workers during these initial phases, shoveling dirt beside a single rail line with four small cars and two horses pulling it. Let's continue on. Our next image here, this one is labeled the Executive Committee who assisted in securing the World's Fair for Chicago. Initially, we have the indication on the right side of the image that this is a plate numbered two. This would indicate that this image is most likely an engraving, possibly. What are your thoughts? All right, let's examine this image. Firstly, the background. Not real. At all. It is illustrated. We even have this strange blurring action on the bottom left side 
that is unusual. Furthermore, it's really unfortunate when the background has a mind of its own, is it not? Like when it blends into the top of this gentleman's head? Let me tell you guys, the amount of photos I took where the intricate molding lining the walls would interfere with my subjects was so numerous. If I had a nickel for every time that happened. Anyways. This also tends to remind me of taking family photos when you gather everyone up and begin with when I say cheese or smile you need to look at the camera and the end result is this image literally everyone looking in a different direction yet there is that one person that followed the direction this guy or maybe this is like a 19th century version of a terrible album cover where the photographer told them to just look into the distance, but didn't tell them where exactly to look. Okay, that's enough. That's enough. Let's move on to our next image. Now, this image is labeled as Director General Davis's private office. Some of you may notice that this image was used briefly in the introduction video. So let's examine this a little further. So an interesting start because our medium is indicated by our uh, watermark, I suppose, in the bottom left, if you could call that a watermark, or maybe just a signature. Furthermore, we have a small section that describes this in the text above the image, which reads as follows. Through the courtesy of Director General George R. Davis, we were afforded an opportunity to send our artist to his sanctum sanctorum and obtain this accompanying photograph, which represents General Davis sitting at his desk, engaged in conversation with two visitors. So please take note of some of the details here, guys. Initially, we have mentioned that an artist was sent now, is one who takes photographs an artist? Yes, I would absolutely say they are. Anyone who excels in a particular craft could be described as an artist. However, if I was describing someone who takes photographs, I would probably use the term photographer. Or possibly this is merely a language difference of over a century. Furthermore, where was this artist sent? They were sent to General Davis's Sanctum Sanctorum, which is a term you don't necessarily hear too often. Sanctum Sanctorum, the Holy of Holies. There are architectural wonders in this world that will bring you to your knees emotionally from their beauty and magnificence literally eliciting a, an emotional response. And clearly that type of response is only secondary to this room. This room with artwork masterfully hung with five feet of wire fastened to the crown molding, if that's even what it is. Yet our writer, who was seemingly so enthralled with declaring this space a place of literal worship, they forgot to count how many individuals were actually in attendance in their own photograph. Reading again from our quote, General Davis sitting at his desk, engaged in conversation with two visitors. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but if General Davis is engaged with two visitors, that would equal three total individuals then how come there are four people in this image? And literally in the next sentence, they confirm that there is indeed four people in the image by naming all four people in the image. Now, am I missing something here? Maybe I'm reading too much into this. Oh, and to also add here, there is a typo further down in this small section in the word this. Now, mistakes happen. I make them all the time. 
yet we are beginning to see more than mistakes and dipping into the realm of just sloppiness. Is this only the case because of the intense scrutiny on my part and finding small errors that could happen to anyone? It is always possible, but is it probable? All right, moving on. Let's go over some details of this particular image. We have some white strokes on the chair in the foreground of this image immediately on the left, just here on the backing, both the top and the bottom rung on the back. Looking a bit further up, uh, we see this old radiator. We can see that these white strokes or highlights uh, go off into the darkness near the bottom. Now each line is not equidistant from each other or even straight for that matter. So let's take a look at this first man on the left side. We see some highlight strokes along the bottom of his pants near the shoes and on both legs. There is a darker stroke along his back near the window to differentiate his clothing or lightly colored shirt uh, from the light of the window. And even his hair and maybe facial features have been retouched, possibly. The ear in particular, which has a strangely large lobe at the bottom, is curious. Now moving on to who I'm going to assume is George Davis in the center of this image, who also has similar highlight markings on his pants. We can see the strokes here on the underside of his shoe, just here, and along the bottom of his pants as well. Looking here at his arm placed on the chair, we can see a highlight that has been applied to give definition to his arm against the clearly darker parts of the image and the chair. And what about his face? Do you have any thoughts here? Is the beard illustrated? Has his hair been retouched? We also have this indication of blurring or a fuzziness here. It almost resembles a smoke trail from a pipe or something. I'm actually unsure what this might be, but wanted to point it out. Uh, next we have this gentleman on the right side sitting at the desk who, again, has the same highlight features as the other men, especially on the elbow right here. Next is his face. Now this may be due to this dark stroke on his nose, but it distorts the perspective of his face and it just it looks flat. I'm having a hard time pinpointing why his face seems out of place, but something feels off, something feels different. Anyways, moving on. The last figure in the image, our man in the back. Now this guy has the same highlights as mentioned before on all the previous individuals. His whole jacket looks to have a, a white stroke applied to the outer edges. And lastly, I thought the previous man's face was flat. Well, this guy in the back just looks like one of those cardboard cutouts. The perspective of his lean on this desk is just awkward. Possibly illustrated in or maybe cut and placed from another image. Uh, and maybe it's just a perspective issue and I'm completely off. I just feel there is more dimensionality in the picture frame behind him than he himself has. Hopefully that made sense. Now just to finalize, all of these men could in actuality be in this image, and the simple act of highlighting, shading, or retouching certain elements can distort perspective and create a, a cartoonish effect that simply looks unrealistic or flat. This would be considered an art like anything else. A basic understanding of lighting and dimensionality would obviously help and who knows the time constraints for producing this specific image or this publication in general. Regardless, let's continue on. 
I referenced earlier in this video that many photos were the initial construction process, and that may have been poorly worded. It was the initial groundwork, the moving and shaping of the grounds itself. From here we will begin to see the initial building process. And this will be the last image of this book for this episode, and we'll queue up the next round of images that will delve into building and construction. This image is titled, Administration Building in Course of Erection, October 1891. One of the first striking details of this particular image is that there is uh, snow on the ground in October, and maybe some locals of Chicago could enlighten me on the average season of winter in Chicago. Is this usual to have snow on the ground in October? Additionally, it also increases the chances to blow out your highlights or white areas in the image that may make the image uh, unusable. It merely seems unusual to take photos of this nature in the winter with no one around. Was it taken this way in order to showcase the construction without any obstructions of people or machinery? That seems to be unknown. So let's take a look at a few finer details. We have this strange artifact on the right side that looks like a brush stroke, and not a minor one, it is quite large, or maybe even it is a scratch at the very edge here. And looking closely at some of this lattice work above the main archway, we see that certain areas are blurry. I'm unsure if this is part of the photograph, yet we do have areas that appear quite clear, and other areas in some cases right beside it that look blurry. Now looking into the scaffolding and interior of this building, we do see some people at work, a skeleton crew at best, not many to speak of. Overall, we do have building supplies, we have scaffolding, we have some mechanisms that look like cranes or hoists, uh, we do not have a medium, though. To close out this episode, I would like to add one final image, and it may look familiar. This image is from a book titled Photographs of the World's Fair, an elaborate collection of photographs of the buildings, grounds, and exhibits of the World's Columbian Exposition, 1894. This clearly shows the image we explored depicting Columbus, or the statue of Columbus, rather. However, it looks to be the original photograph. It is much easier to discern the individuals as being more realistic than the previous image that was presented in the last video, where most of these men had illustrative elements and some even appearing totally drawn in. So what is the reasoning for showing this? It is instances like this that I feel obligated to show as much data as possible, to allow you to make objective and reasonable conclusions. I'm not making these videos to swindle a cheap narrative. This is not information to take at face value. It needs to be reviewed and investigated on your end also. In all honesty, I came into this area of research looking to discount or disprove a massive alternative historical narrative. This is not to say that history itself is neat and tidy. It is messy. It is broken up by wars, altered by religions, kingships, royalty, lost by burnings of texts, scrolls, and books. It can be written by the victors and is ultimately recorded by humans with their own bias and perspective. Of course there will be discrepancies. However, there continues to be mysteries that I cannot quickly dismiss. After many years of collecting and reviewing books such as this, I can say with certainty that there is genuine mystery within events such as this and history as a whole. 
our past doesn't feel like a topic that can be simply taught, but rather an enigma that is studied. This is an admission that I was incorrect about this image, because this appears to be the original. It is still curious about the previous editing of this image and even the rhetoric that surrounds this event. The logistics in general to get this event from hundreds of acres of swampy marsh to hundreds of elaborate buildings with electricity and plumbing that include various displays of the world's countries is simply mind-boggling. The vast amounts of money referenced throughout these documents is somewhat odd, in my opinion, maybe indicating that all of this financial excess somehow completed this endeavor in record time and was able to bypass any logistical nightmare. Which I'm sure anyone watching who works in the business of providing a service or trade could confirm that money does not always expedite process service, or craftsmanship for that matter. These will be subjects to explore in future videos as we go through images of various buildings at this event. Now I'd like to leave you with a section from this book I just referenced, and it's from the preface. In many cases the rhetoric of these books is so very interesting to me. Maybe this is merely creative writing for the time. Or maybe there is something deeper here. It reads as follows. It would be ungracious and indeed untrue to say that if the citizens of Chicago had known the impediments to be encountered, the obstacles they would have to surmount before they could achieve success, they would have been deterred from their endeavors. Never. They would have armed themselves for the fight they would have doubled their energy and determination, and even had the dark gloom of the financial crisis, which did come in the very midst of the fair, cast its shadow before, still they would have gone on. They would have built those buildings, which the world has admired. They would have converted a swamp into a fairyland. They would have wrested success from every opposing force. The World's Fair has been a fact. The nations have come, have seen and have been conquered. They have bowed the knee in homage to the greatest enterprise in history, have acknowledged that in the White City was found the acme of human genius. And with that, I would like to thank you for your time again and hopefully this presentation was enjoyable, entertaining, and informative. If you gained any value from this, give the video a like. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments below. And if you're interested in learning more about the manipulation of historical documents, consider subscribing and learning about it with me.